Judiciary Committee is called back to order from our recess of earlier today. And we are on questions from members. Uh, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we, we actually have the uh, bill in our possession now, right? So yes, can, we do. Can I offer the... Uh, you know, actually what we're going to do is we're going to do the... Questions first. The, fir the We have an amendment first, right? We have your amendment. Is it author's amendment? Um, Mr. Chair, we do. We have the author's amendment. Because I'm, I'm assuming sure your I... A20 amendment is drafted to the bill as amended by the author's amendment, so... I hope so. Yes. So let's adopt the uh, author's amendment first. And Mr. Chair, is that the, I think that's the A4. A4. Yeah. Okay, A4. so Mr. Chair, first of all, I'd like yep. to move the bill. Oh, sure, yeah. I'd like yep. to move House File 4327 to be recommended to be re referred to the uh, Health and Human Service that is Finance your motion. Division. That is the motion we have before us, and uh, Chair Leveling then moves the A4 amendment. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion passes. The A4 amendment is adopted. Uh, and so now we have Representative Barr. Go ahead. You have the A20 amendment? Uh, A18 <coughs> is what I've got. Oh, A20-718. Yes, sorry. Okay. I don't think A20 I have that, Mr. Chair. It deletes the new language on lines 14 and 15 of page 2, which is except that a public health emergency may be continued for up to 90 days. It takes that language out. Correct. Go ahead, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author. Um, the reason I offered this is the governor, uh, with the uh, with the uh, con uh, through consultation with the executive council, has up to 30 days already for this kind of authority, and, it, and then it can the language currently continues on that uh, if it's if he needs authority past 30 days, he does need to call the legis must call the legislature back into session. And if it gets past 30 days, I think we should be consulted anyway. So we should not allow this for three months for the governor to uh, basically have. And it, this is a lot of authority to give to any governor. 30 days, I believe, is enough without legislative input. That's why I offered the amendment. I hope you can consider this as a friendly amendment. Uh, Chair Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So. Um, Representative Barr, I think the concern is a good one, but I think that your your solution is a little bit extreme. And we've been talking in the interim about an idea that was put forward by Chair Johnson, which I think uh, draws a really a more nuanced response to this issue. Because the problem I see there is that we may not want to come back if there's really a pandemic we may not want to come back into session, and that would basically force us to do that. I think it would be better, kind of the way he was suggesting it, to, to have a, a check back in with the legislature, the ability for us to come in and then end the thing, um, kind of doing it the other way. So more of an opt-out than an opt-in because of the nature of the situation that we could be having. So I'm more than willing to, to consider this. I think we share a concern about runaway executive power. And in fact, the governor came to both our caucuses apparently and said, don't give the executive too much power. And I agree with him. I mean, there is a reason we are a legislature and we are here, each one of us, fulfilling what we think is our duty to our state. And that's really important to me and to all of us. So we want to get this right, but we're also seeing that we could be facing a pretty serious situation where we don't want to come back. And if we set it up so that we have to come back to continue the emergency powers, that could be not a good situation. So um, I think there's, um, and also, you know what, I'd like to ask um, Margaret Kelly if she's ready to come down and sit here with me from the Department of Health. Um, sure. She's here now to answer questions from, from members. But I would just say, I think we're getting some other language drafted. Um, Ms. Clarkvist from House Research is working on another more amendment language that um, the department, I think, has worked on and that is kind of along the lines of what Chair Johnson was bringing to us. And um, I haven't seen that language, but um, I don't know if you would want uh, Ms. Kelly to speak to that, but I would just say I would ask members not to support this amendment at this time, although I certainly am on board with you on the concern. 
Sorry, go ahead, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Leveling, I, I will withdraw the amendment for now, but if there's not something that addresses those concerns when it hits the floor, I will have the amendment back on the floor, if that's okay with you. Well, I guess it's not really okay with you. I can <laughs> offer the amendment if I want to, but this is a concern, and I will be offering this if there's not, and I, I will give you the latitude to try and come up with a more nuanced solution. We'll Thank do you. it in a Minnesota way. Representative okay Barr, I would expect yeah. nothing less. <laughs> Too much passive aggressive, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Representative Barr. Uh, yeah, I, I, am, I am as interested as, as anyone in making sure that we, we sand the edges off uh, uh, anything that comes through in a hurry. But next on the list is Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, and, and I apologize, it's been a few hours since we covered this, but uh, Representative Liebling, in the DE6-1 amendment, I'm looking at lines 5.8 through 5.12. And I, I just, for the record, I just want to understand when we're talking about data sets, and it says that the data will remain private, who is going to maintain that privacy? Sure, Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Albright. Um, First of all, I want to clarify for members, I think representative, there are different versions of this bill, and I think what Representative Albright is talking about is the A4 amendment, right? Am I right, <laughs> Representative Albright? Because you're looking, oh. there's another version moving. I apologize for all this. It's just a fact well, you from said the speech. 5.12, are you talking about the A4, Representative Albright? One moment, please. This is the amendment we just adopted. Representative Liebling, as I look at the A4 amendment that amends the 3980DE6-1. So, Representative Albright, if I could. That's not the right The DE6-1, this committee doesn't know from the DE6-1. That's not in this committee. I, you know, again, I again, apologize for this. Again, then, really to the A4 important. amendment, uh, Representative Liebling, when it talks about data remaining private, both for individuals or non-public data, business plans, uh, and the list goes on, who is going to be responsible for maintaining the privacy of that data? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, for that, I would um, turn to um, Ms. Ryderick, who's sitting next to me, and she can, she's the expert on that. Go ahead, Ms. Ryderick, please introduce yourself for the record. Yeah, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Diane Ryderick. I'm the director of the Health Policy uh, Division at the Department of Health and Representative Albright. Um, as this language gives the Department of Health authority to administer the grant and loan fund, the staff who would be involved in administering the program would have the responsibility to keep the data appropriately protected as private as we do with any other data that we have responsibility to hold. Representative Albright. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Sir, was it Ms. Rogers or Ms. Ryberg? Uh, Mr. Chair, neither one. Ryderick. Oh, Roger. <laughs> Ryderick. Nobody Ryder. ever gets it right. <laughs> Just to be fair, I still struggle with her name. <laughs> <laughs> Ryderick. Okay, excellent. Uh, are you good, Representative Albright? Just one follow up. And Representative Liebling, uh, you and I talked about this at the conclusion of uh, our committee hearing this morning, but I do think it's important that. Um, the information that we talked about uh, is disseminated to the rest of the, the committee. But we talk a lot about, or we did this morning talk a lot about the power vested to the governorship. But I think it's also important to appreciate what is vested in the health commissioner. And it's not, not so much the separation, but where do those duties lie? I understand, as Representative Liebling said to me, the governor has the uh, wherewithal and the veracity to terminate a commissioner at any point in time. But I'm just wondering, what can the health commissioner do that is not elaborated here on at their own discretion? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, I'm Margaret Kelly, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. I'm sorry, could you say your name again? Margaret Kelly, Thank Deputy you, Commissioner at the Department of Health. And before I answer that question, I just want to take this opportunity to remind you all 
that if you are sick at home, you should stay at home. And if you're at work and you start feeling sick, like a fever or chills or aches or sniffles, you should go home. And if you feel you need to go to the doctor, you should call first to let them know you're coming in. Given that, the Commissioner of Health has the authority in law to isolate and quarantine individuals in the event of an infectious disease or communicable disease outbreak. Currently, we are not invoking that authority. We are asking people to self-isolate or to self-quarantine. Uh, I don't know if we have invoked that authority uh, maybe once in the recent past for tuberculosis. It is not something we often use. We rely on individual participation in our requests. And in fact, the fed, the federal level, uh, quarantining folks who are on the cruise ship is something that had not been done since I believe the 1960s. So, Ms. Kelly, you, Mr. as a follow-on to that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Would the governor invoke that, or would it be unilaterally to the commissioner by virtue of the authority vested in that position by the governor? Deputy Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, the commissioner's authority is in statute in 144 and is separate from the governor's emergency powers authority. And I believe that the commissioner can invoke those I don't recall if she needs to consult with the governor or not. I would have to consult. Representative Albright. Mr. Chair, while we're waiting, we do have Chair some Lee, amendments that could be handed out now. To let's the, do that then. To the and some amendments. <laughs> Did I miss something? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative. Deputy the, Commissioner Kelly. The Commissioner has the authority in law to. Uh, isolate and quarantine individuals under her authority without consultation with the governor. Thank you. Okay. Representative Albright. That's it. Uh, Chair Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just wanted to re uh, reiterate some of um, Representative Barr's concerns. Um, and if I were rewriting this thing, I would do something about that 90 days. Because if you leave the language the way it is, there's a conflict. Because that 90 days um, does not, uh, is not consistent with uh, paragraph B that's below that. Uh, and so I think we need to look at something less than 90 days, maybe 60 days. And I understand we don't know how long this thing is going to last, but within 60 days, hopefully um, the legislature could come back. Um, the other issue is, I, and I've, I've since found out, my idea this morning was we need to have some something in place where legislators can we can convene remotely when there's a situation like this or war breaks out, I don't know, whatever the, the situation may be, but in very extenuating circumstances and exigent circumstances where we can, I don't know if it's teleconference, what it is, but my understanding now is that it's in the Constitution that we have to do our business in this county. And uh, so it would require a constitutional amendment, which we really don't have time for right now. So, um, but I think that's something that that we need to look at in the future just as a precaution because, gosh, there's going to be instances like this where we're, we may not be able to make it back to the Capitol, but it's still important that we do our jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that's all the questions I have for members. And we've got the amendments. So, Mr. Chair, I would move the Shirley A6 Liebling. amendment. The A6 amendment. Why don't you tell us about that, Chair Liebling? So uh, maybe I could ask... Um, Ms. Clarkvist, if she's here. Ms. Clarkvist? Yeah, maybe I could ask her to come up and this, since this is a page in line and I'm just seeing it for the first time myself, maybe she could just explain what it, what it do, does. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Clarkvist. Um, Mr. Chair and members, I'm Elizabeth Clarkvist from House Research. 
So the A6 amendment makes um, three changes to um, section two of the bill. Um, the first one is on line 2.15. It clarifies that it's a peacetime emergency that's the type of emergency that can be extended, not a public health emergency. So um, starting after the comma on line 3.14, it'll read, except that a peacetime emergency declared due to a public health emergency may be extended by resolution of the executive council for up to 90 days. So it makes that um, clause consistent with the preceding portion of the sentence. Um, the next two changes are made to, par to paragraph B. Um, in the second sentence, it, it clarifies that the scope of that sentence applies to peacetime emergencies that are declared for any reason other than a public health emergency. And then the new sentence um, sets up a procedure for peacetime emergencies that are declared due to a public health emergency. And it says, um, if, if that kind of emergency is extended beyond 30 days and when the legislature is not in session, the governor must call the legislature into session unless or if requested jointly by the speaker and the Senate president. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, conversation on this? I would, I'm compelled to point out, uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Clarkfest, does, upon the call of the governor to convene both houses, is there, <coughs> do they have to accept? Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Clark, Albright, do you mean um, in a peacetime emergency that's declared due to a public health emergency? Yes. Um, no, the, the governor would only convene both houses if the speaker and the Senate president agree. Mr. Okay. Chair and Ms. Clarkfest, does this amendment presume that the legislature or either a chamber has adjourned sine die? Ms. Clarkfest? Um, Mr. Chair, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe Matt Gehring could help me with that Kirby question. It doesn't say it in there, so I'm, a, I'm guessing the answer is no. But Mr. Gehring? While they're, while they're conversing about this, um, I did want to point out that uh, Ms. Mullen did send me an answer to my question about the origins of this legislation. This was immediate post 9-11 legislation that was model legislation passed in many different states. Uh, and uh, the 2.22 to 2.24 outlining the uh, permissive parameters of the government authority over the National Guard has changed substantially. Uh, under federal law since 9-11. When 9-11 happened and we decided we were gonna have wars in two countries on top of an existing tax cut, uh, the federal government realized they didn't have enough money to do that. Uh, and so they said, reserve component, you're up. We pay you 39 training days a year as opposed to 365. That's how we can, that's how we can go to war and still pay for it. Uh, but what happened over the course of that time was that the uh, ability of governors to limit the use of their own National Guards was substantially abrogated under another uh, federal uh, security act. And that meant that the current governor, uh, once the Joint Chiefs was put on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, once the National Guard representative was put on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has virtually no authority over our own National Guard in the face of being activated under Title 10. I realize this sounds like inane, but it is very relevant uh, because to the extent that a national health emergency occurs in some other state and all of our National Guard members are federalized because they serve under the National Guard Bureau and are mobilized to a different region of the country, we have zero ability to have the National Guard control any kind of public health emergency in the state of Minnesota because they're all gone and there's not a darn thing the governor can do about it. So, <clears throat> and maybe neither here nor there, but I think it's relevant based upon assumptions we're making of the 
the public health assets we'll have here to help control it. That's it. Anyway, go ahead, uh, Chair Liebling. Oh, no, Mr. Gary, you're going on. <clears throat> go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Matt Gary from House Research. Representative Albright, the way I understood your question was whether the the session that would be convened under this amendment would be a special session or not? Is that what you're asking? Whether we had adjourned sine die. Does it assume whether we adjourned sine die? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, I don't think it makes an assumption either way. So you, you could have a, a, a public health emergency in either sort of year of the biennium, and so this would effectively re require the governor to call a special session at, at any time, regardless of whether the, the session has been adjourned sine die. Ms. Mr. Gehring, and the reason I ask that is because on line 1.8, it says is not in session. My presumption is that that would, again, infer that we are sine die adjourned, correct? And the reason I ask that and why I think it's important is because under the current protocol, the my presumption, my understanding is the governor can call a special session or, or call us back in a session. It's not at the request of the House and the Senate, is it? Mr. Gehring? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, that's correct. So the constitutional process is, gives the governor authority to call a special session at any time he or she deems necessary. Okay. okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Liebling. So, Representative Albright, as, as I'm understanding it, I mean, what this does is it, it you know, we, we often struggle with this, right? When we, some of us think there should be a special session for something, the governor was, won't call it, or, you know, we've been in this a lot, whether it's after signee die or just between, the, you know, during the interim. So I don't know that it, that part of it makes any difference, but um, I think what this is doing is it's saying it says, if requested jointly by the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. So in other words, it shifts the control over a special session to the House and Senate in this situation to tell the governor, you must call, uh, you must call a special session. Now, since I guess I would wonder if that is constitutional since the governor, because it does seem to bump up against the prerogative of the governor to call the special, I don't know how that works, Mr. Gehring, maybe that's a, is that kind of where you're going? The representative well, leaving exactly to the point, I think we might be diluting what is already in the Constitution from the perspective of if for other reasons, such as a special session, the governor is requesting and, and calling us back into session, it seems like we're setting up and stipulating a special set of circumstances under uh, Section 144 that isn't in the Constitution, but for an express purpose. And, and I wonder if we're setting a precedent here that could be diluted and used in other means mm -hmm. other than what is in the Constitution already, which is kind of the, the bedrock of what the three equal branches of government are, are aligned for. Absolutely. And Mr. Chair and Representative Albright, I think that's what the statute is already doing, isn't it? Because that's that. Uh, okay. Because there's already in here language: the governor must issue a call immediately convening both houses of the legislature. I mean, that's current law. I understand so that, Representative Levin, but you go further to say if requested violation. jointly. Rep hold, hold on a second, Representative Albright. But you're you're going beyond that then to say if requested jointly. I don't know why anyone would put in legislation the governor must do. I, I would, if it were me, I'd just say this must happen, because what if the governor decided not to? Then you got to go to court, get a writ of mandamus issued, forcing the governor to do his job. I don't know, but that's just me. Um, anyway, did you want to did you want to suggest any other modifications? I, 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 well, the intent is certainly appreciated. I think it's problematic. For sure. Okay. Well, considering the speed at which we're moving in this, I'm, I, I know that this entire thing is a work in progress, and I know that Chair Liebling will, will make tweaks where necessary between here and when we get to the floor. So, um, and Mr. Chair, if I may. Chair Liebling. Thank you. And you know what? A Representative Albright, I didn't draft this language either, and it's everything's happening really fast. I see the, the problem there, and I think what Chair Johnson had kind of suggested before was a, you know, a process where there would be a consultation with I don't think his, well, he could speak for himself, but I don't think it was contemplating calling back the legislature. I think it was 
getting authorization from a wider circle of people to continue the emergency. And that is how this language ended up. So I think there's still room to work on this a little bit, but I like the, di I think the direction is a good one, right? Where we're, we're not just opening it up for 90, but we're saying something has to happen after 30 to continue the authorization. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as I've been listening to this, I'm, I'm wondering if we can strike on the last sentence of the amendment 1.9, strike everything beginning with the word if. So put the period after legislature. In other, words, in other words, to create the requirement that we come back into session after 30 days, but it's not contingent upon agreement of the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader. Because also another problem is you have the word and. What if the Speaker of the House wanted to come into session, but the, they, they didn't agree, right? Or based on a catastrophe that might be happening, I don't know the succession line of the Senate President. Let's say First and second were completely indisposed. And there wasn't a Senate president to be able to agree. So just putting the burden on, after 30 days, the governor must call. So it's not contingent upon agreement. Chair Liebling. Well, Mr. Chair and, and <laughs> Representative Lucero, um, I think your point about you know the speaker and the Senate president, maybe you know that's a, that's a different concern. But I, I kind of think you're going the other way. Because the concerns that have been expressed here are, can we, by statute, make the governor call a special session when the Constitution gives him or her that authority. I think that's the, that's the concern. We need a way. So rather than, I, I would say, rather than messing around with calling special sessions, I would say we probably need to go back to Chair Johnson's original idea, I think, which was just to put in maybe a few more people who have to be consulted and in the loop before we continue a public health emergency. Uh, that way, you know, that would be my thought. I mean, uh, something like that. But I think what you're doing kind of goes the goes the wrong way. It's it just tells the governor to do it without what what this is uh, drafted to do is I think is to give the the Senate and the and the House the ability to get back into session to stop this thing. And what you're doing is taking about out our ability to make that request and just putting it on the governor. And, and the point is we don't, might not want to come back into session. Everybody might agree that this is, sure, this is a bad emergency. We don't want to come back. What your suggestion is doing is telling us we have to come back under those circumstances. I just, I just think you're kind of, we need to, this is hard to do on the fly, let's face it. <laughs> it is, it is, but you're doing great, Chair Liebling, on the fly. Representative Lucero? Uh, great, and, and I agree. We're all, it, this is on the fly, and we're just trying to throw stuff on the table to, to get it to come in. I'm just trying to think of these scenarios, uh, get an agreement. Also, uh, what if there were members of the legislature that did or did not want to come in? It gives the power just to, the, to two people, right? Rather, and there may be dissension among the 201 within the bodies. Right, there may be, uh, there isn't a consensus or unanimous opinion. So, I, I, yeah, anyway, we're doing it on the fly and I get it. Okay, uh, Chair Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I guess I'm an advocate for leaving that, that language in uh, subdivision two that starts on the top of page two. I, I'm just, I'm a believer in leaving it intact. I think it's fine the way it is. And because even with this amendment, you're now giving the authority to extend again to the executive council, which again is the executive branch. It's not the legislative branch. And if we're trying to get away from centralizing power in the exec executive branch and keeping in mind what the governor told each of our caucuses yesterday, don't, don't give me too much power. And he used to be in the legislative branch when he was in Congress. Um, he understands that, that delegate delicate balance so I, I think we're making this a bigger thing that it has to be I think there's a way to do it with current language they put the 30 days in there for a reason and I and, and if other states adopted it at 30 days I think the reason is because of that balance of power issue because during states of emergency you're really you're asking the executive branch to wield a lot of power <coughs> make a lot of decisions that ordinarily are made um, by the legislative branch so 
I really appreciate you trying to figure out a way. And either I think they're the way is to leave it the way it is. But um, thanks for offering the the language, Representative or Chair Liebling. Chair Liebling. Mr. Chair, well, first of all, I just want to say to all members, you know, you don't have to tell me that you're trying to help because I know we're all trying to help. So let's just give that as a given. This committee is really good that way, right? And we get a lot of good products out of this committee for that reason. So let's just kind of put all that stuff aside. Um, we're working here, and I think we might have some language that might kind of help this. So um, I think the real concern, and I, I, Representative Scott, I think you're absolutely right. We want to make sure this is a legislative input decision. Um, we don't want to give all our power to the executive branch, um, you know, and we're so afraid that we let somebody else do what we should be doing and make our decisions for us. We don't want that. So I think that what we could do is um, if we, in the amendment, if, uh, if instead of, um, so on line 1.3 of the amendment, um, right now it says that the, um, the public health emergency may be continued by resolution of the executive council up for up to 90 days. That could say by resolution of the legislative advisory commission, which consists of, I know I'm on that, Chair Benson's on that right now. Um, Mr. Gehring, who else is on that? It's the, it's a mix of. Oh. Mr. Chair, Mr. so the Legislative Advisory Commission, um, the membership sort of depends on the substance that they're considering at the time, but it includes as permanent members the Senate Majority Leader, the Senate Finance Chair, the Speaker of the House, and the House Ways and Means Committee Chair. And then there are others, as I said, depending on the substance that's being considered, other members also sit in the commission. So, Mr. Chair, Chair um, this is a, um, so that's a process that's kind of well established that's been used. In fact, that was process was used to release that first pot of public health money that was in the account. And it was very quick. Um, it was a process where um, MMB sent out a request and then I voted, all the members of the LAC voted by email. So it went really fast, but we did vote. And there's a whole, there's a section on that which Maybe Mr. Gehring could tell us more about, but that might be a way to, to balance this. I just would put that out there for members' consideration. So if in the amendment, instead of by resolution of the executive committee, which would now be online, I, I kind of write these in, in my main, my main bill. So line 2.15 of the bill would now say, um, except that a peacetime <coughs> emergency declared due to a public health emergency may be continued by resolution of the Legislative Advisory Commission for up to 90 days. Up so 90 that, days. and then we could get rid of the rest of that about calling new special sessions and all that because we wouldn't need it. Normally I'd have uh, research repeat what the amendment is, but um, we are sans. Um, why don't I just have you repeat that? This is on the A6 amendment. Mm -hmm. And what line are was this going in on, Chair Liebling? Well, Mr. Chair, we adopted the A6, so I don't know what no, the we, process we, is. It is. Oh, we didn't. I'm sorry. We didn't adopt it. Okay, so good. Okay. So I think that the... Um, 1.3 of the amendment. So we'll Oh. <laughs> it's been such a long week, I have no voice. You're, on, you're next on the list. Oh. Okay, so Mr. Chair, I think what, sure, what we, would, we would be doing would be on line, so on, now I'm on the A6 amendment. Yep. Mm -hmm. So on line 1.3 of the A6 amendment, we would strike the words executive council and put in um, legislative, what is it, legislative advisory commission. And then we would strike lines 1.4 to 1.9. Do we? That's all, Mr. Chair. That's all, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. 
Do we need to reference a statute number or where <laughs> legislative advisory commission is defined in statute or yeah. do we think that's oh, unnecessary? Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, I think that's what we're doing. I mean, just because, you know. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Reference a statute number as, you know, legislative advisory commission as oh. defined in yep. chapter blah, blah, blah. Yep. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, so the legislative advisory commission is it codified in section 3.30. That's, that's the statute, 3.30? Okay. All right, then. So maybe Mr. Guerin could restate the amendment then with the appropriate. Uh, sure. Oh, why there's, I heard there's a reference to the Legislative Advisory Commission up to 90 days. What? Not, not in this world, then. That's in the underlying bill. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. It's line 2.15 in the underlying bill. So I'll, I mean, I'll restate it. Uh, so on line 1.3, well, on line 1.3 of the A6 amendment, strike the words executive council and replace them with legislative advisory commission as defined in Minnesota statute 3.30. And strike lines 1.4 to 1.9. We cool, Mr. Chair. Uh, was that Representative Albright? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So with that modification of the A6, does that affect anything in the bill as amended on line 2.15 through 2.17? I don't know why would it so we still we still have the uh, for a continuance of up to 90 days yes okay chair Lesh may I ask a question of uh, mr. Gearing sure go ahead mr. Gearing if everything after the comma on line 2.14 was stricken so you strike 2.15, 2.16, and 2.17. And you just end with, by resolution of the Executive Council, up to 30 days, period. What would that force on day 31? Mr. Gary, I mean, we're kind of asking for a little bit of speculation, but go ahead and speculate. There, there's got to be some kind of procedure that's yeah. established in law. Yeah. Okay. Do you know, Mr. Gary? Court. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, I guess I, I need to think about that a little bit. I'm not off the top of my head. I'm not sure. That's fair. Do you? Let me ask you this. Do you? Do you have an idea in your head of what you think it would uh, trigger, Representative Albright? I think I do. Well, why don't you tell us? I, I, I think it actually would uh, re then incite the governor to call for a special session. If a special session was warranted. But I think it actually goes back to the constitutional power vested with the governor to then decide what needs to be done, which invokes the authority and the collaboration with the legislature. I just wonder if we're trying to make more of something than what already would happen. Well, we don't really do that around here that much. <laughs> That's why I'm on the committee, Mr. Chair. Just to stir Understood. the pot. Um, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could think about this and what was brought up because I'm not sure I necessarily disagree with Representative Albright on that. Think about that. What's the next step on this? Uh, Chair so, Lewis? Mr. Chair, this is going back to Health and Human Services Finance, but actually, since this is a clone bill, whatever this committee passes, we will take and do an amendment in Ways and Means. That's kind of the plan. Okay. So, because the bill right now that, that contains this language is in Ways and Means. Got it. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Chair, also, I think that um, the Council for the Department of Health also brought up another little issue, and I think it might behoove us to, um, if we want to do this here, if you still do, um, to kind of let them work it out a little bit. 
before we try to vote on it. Um, okay. I, and I'm sorry, I didn't really hear what Representative Albright was concerned about. Uh, I don't want to make you repeat it, but we could, if I need to know, I, you might need to repeat it. Can you repeat it, Representative Albright? <laughs> Representative Liebling, I think when I look at lines 2.15 and 2.16 particularly, I think that we're trying to accommodate something that would already happen under constitutional authority. So if you went back to uh, line 2.14 and ended after days, the question then begets asking, well, then what would happen? And my assertion is that it would force the governor, by his constitutional authority, to call us into session. If he wanted to continue. If he wanted to. And, 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 but so this uh, continuation of 90 days, that's, I think that's our hang-up. But, but if we remove that, I think it actually avails us to what's already in statute under constitution, constitutional authority that the governor possesses. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, if I may, thank you for that. Um, I love the thinking that's going on here. The, I think the problem with that, Representative Albright, is that that would force us to come back in special session or force the governor to call us back. You might not wanna come back. If there's this kind of emergency, and that basically says he can't continue to have the powers he needs unless the legislature is able to come back in special session. And I think that puts us in a very dangerous spot that this is meant to take care of in general. And that, that's the concern. What if there's a pandemic? We already, members are already nervous. Should we really be here? Should, you know, those questions are here. If there's, a, if there's a serious pandemic in the state, do we wanna make the governor literally call us back into session in order to continue to handle the emergency? I don't think we do. Chair Lush. Thank you, Chair Lush. Um, the, the governor has the constitutional authority at that point to call us back into session, or under Chapter 12, he also is vested in the opportunity, basically under the disaster provisions, to decide what is in the best interests of the state under the disaster provisions in Chapter 12. But I think what it does is it forces the, the governor to discuss the options. We're talking about circumstances that we have never dealt with. Hopefully we'll never deal with them again, but the point being is that they may be different next time. And so our constitution has served us quite well since 1858. I, I think that we're, we're dabbling in a gray area that um, I don't think that we have to because of not only what's in chapter uh, 144, but also chapter 12 with regard to the power that's vested to the governor already. And I think to the remarks that he's made in both caucuses when he said, don't give me too much power. I think we've already given him what he necessarily needs to take care of the decision making process, either invoking the legislature to uh, collaborate with him or do it on his own if there is a fear of coming back together again. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Albright, I, I understand your, I think we're on the same page in terms of what we want to have happen and how we all want to balance this out. I just think the language you're proposing, as I understand it, kind of cuts off his ability to do that. I mean, well, let me, that's let me my this. understanding. Okay, we're all hashing this out here. I want to bet there's somewhere, someone in this room or listen to us on the feed or whatever who has a pretty good idea that they know the answer to this or uh, what they need to happen, but they're just all going to let us look dumb if we pass this out of here and then fix us somewhere hereafter. So if there's someone who, who is an expert in this area, um, Raise your hand or come on down now. If not, I'm just going to call on Considine. Go ahead, Chair Considine. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I ask it, Representative Albright to yield to a question? 
could you enumerate a little bit on that chapter 12 what he would uh, be able to do after the 30 days, please? Chair Gonsadine, I have the book open to that chapter in my office right now, and if you'll indulge me, I'd be happy to go and get it. Sure. I got one over here. Okay, oh. good. Oh, this one? I didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> I took it. <laughs> while, while he's sifting through that, we're going to go to Chair Johnson. Uh, Chair Lash, Representative Levine, I appreciate what you're trying to do. Um, um, for me, I'm trying to get, make sure the legislature is involved in this, these decisions. Sure. Um, part of it might be the law enforcement part of me, but if we have to come back, even in uh, dangerous situations, we need to come back. That's what we were elected to do. Um, we only need to have 68 people here. They all vote for it, and it passes. The Senate only needs 34. And if we're coming back on a special session, generally things are worked out so we know exactly what we're going to do ahead of time. Um, it's just I want to make sure that the majority leader, minority leaders in the House, in the Senate, are know exactly what's going on and involved in the process to make sure things are done right to keep the legislature involved. Um, I did look... Uh, Look at uh, 3.30. We'd have to rewrite that chapter, that section as well, because the only authority they have is five to ten thousand dollars worth of finances to move from one area to another, and that's the only duties they have is financial. So, I understand where uh, Representative Albright is. I know also the health department said on these situations they need about 90 days to keep that curve low. So our health care system doesn't get overloaded. And if we can keep it from getting overloaded, everybody's going to be much better off instead of that huge spike where we overload the system and unfortunately people's health is at risk because they, we don't have the facilities to take care of them. But that's what I was trying to do. I hope, hope you understand and I appreciate the work you did on this. Representative Albright. Thank you, Chair Lush. Representative Considine. Uh, the innumerable uh, distinctions in Chapter 12, starting with 12.28, uh, where it describes the governor's orders, rules, and enforcements. And then it also goes to 12.29, where a declaration of a local emergency. It also goes to 12.301, where there is a talk of community disaster loans, governor's authority. Then on the next page, 12.31, uh, subdivision, Three, effective declaration of peacetime emergency. 12.32, governor's orders and rules effect. 12.33, assistance between political subdivisions. I think we've got it covered. I'm actually fairly comfortable with that. Um, I, I, if we've got a way for the governor to move forward, and it sounds like we do, um, do you have some... Will you yield for a question? Or is there still a, a concern as to um, a Chapter 12 seems to outline it pretty well. Can I can I interrupt and uh, call on uh, um, Chair Scott invoking the ghost of Mary Liz Holberg, <laughs> who is speaking to us from beyond the legislative grave. Uh, go ahead, Chair Scott. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Hello, Mary Liz, I know you're listening. Um, what she texted me is the need to call special session is only to extend special powers. If they don't need special power, they don't need to call a special session. Does that help you, Mr. Kassan? Again, I'm getting kind of comfortable with this. All right. Again, leaves language where it is. All right. That's what it does. Representative Carlson. I'm good. Okay. Ch uh, Chair Liebling, go ahead. So, I, so, Mr. Chair and members, I, you know, I, what I think would be make sense to move forward here is the piece about putting the legislative, um, 
I keep losing the name, the Legislative Advisory Commission. That's because, you know, we also have another LAC, which is the Legislative Audit Commission, which I'm on, so I'm having trouble with this. But the Legislative Advisory Commission, um, I, I don't think, Chair Johnson, that you're quite accurate about what that does. And maybe Mr. Gehring could talk about that a little bit more, because uh, what that process is. But, um, you know, I think we should put that in as into the amendment as being you have to bring that group in and get authorization to continue for the other 60 days. And maybe what we ought to do, in fact, Mr. Chair, is bring the health department back up to talk about why they need the 90 and why they think 90 might be, you know, more the trajectory of what could happen. So that's the first piece. I also want to put on the table that counsel for the agency has also pointed out to me that we, we do have a, an inconsistency here that we need to attend to, which is in, in part B, and I could have him come up and explain that. But yeah, have gonna, him come up. If you call yeah. him up, where are they? Come on up. Please introduce yourself for the record and Thank begin you, Mr. your Chair. My name is Robin Benson. I am interim chief legal counsel for the Minnesota Department of Health. Go ahead. So um, for the, the, the members' discussion regarding paragraph B and the um, mandatory call to special session and how to resolve that, uh, if the committee adopts the amendment regarding the um, extension to 90 days by the legislative advisory Council or commission, commission, council, council the LAC, um, then there still needs to be an exception made in that paragraph B so that on day 30 it's not triggered because it's always triggered by default if there's a peacetime emergency. So what I recommend uh, is following uh, just before the sentence about the National Guard that the chair was describing earlier. Uh, at the end of the preceding sentence, insert, except when the peacetime emergency is a public health emergency that has been extended by resolution of the LAC, spelled out. With that change, then you're looking at the extension of up to 90 days uh, being taken care of if it is extended by the LAC and there is no trigger to call a session, you're relying entirely on the LAC at that point. So, um, Chair Liebling, we, we already have an oral amendment uh, before us to the A6 amendment, neither of which have been adopted. I'm not going to entertain another potential oral amendment until we've resolved the other one. Um, what do you want to do? Well, Mr. Chair, I think that uh, what Mr. Benz is telling us is we kind of have to do them both together. I mean, I think I would I would ask the committee to um, uh, let's adopt the that first oral amendment, putting the LAC in instead of the executive council, because that brings in the legislature and allows gives legislative authority being required. I think that's what the LAC does, Mr. Gehring's nodding his head, it brings in legislative authority into the mix to, in order to extend more than 30 days. So I would adopt that and then I would want to maybe, and then. So the, the amendment okay. we have before us, currently as stated by Mr. Gehring says on, on line 1.3 of the A6 amendment, delete executive council and replace it with Legislative Advisory Commission. But what we're saying now is it's Legislative Advisory Council. Well, which is, <laughs> Someone, don't ask me for that. I can't get it straight. Commission. Commission. Legislative Advisory Commission, as defined under Minnesota Statute 3.30, and delete lines 1.4 to 1.9 of the A6 Amendment. That's, current, that's the current oral amendment before us to the A6 Amendment. Correct. Uh, the additional, what you're proposing as an additional or amendment is after line, on line 2.21, after the word legislature, insert the words, except when the, what? Uh, 
Mr. Chair. So if we look at the A6 amendment document, uh, at 1.6 of that document, what we would, if we use that as our framework, instead of after the period on line 21, we would change okay, that. Okay, so you're, so you're re revoking your desire for your, your previous one? Uh, no. He's just clarifying so on here. I'm clarifying where we, which side of the period we're going to put this on. So on line 21 <laughs> of the bill, at the end of that, it says legislature, then a period. Before the period is where we would then insert the exception that I could state again. You need to state it again because I can't yeah. write that fast. So line 2.21, hmm? the, before the period at the end of it. And after legislature, insert comma, no. except when? Except when the peacetime emergency is a public health emergency that has been extended by resolution of the Legislative Advisory Commission. I suppose we could put extended up to 90 days, but I think extended probably takes care okay, of it. Okay, I got as far as extended. Okay. What's after that? Except when the public, when the peacetime emergency is a public health emergency that has been extended, extended yeah. by resolution of the Legislative Advisory Commission. Okay, all right, one second. Any other comments on that from committee members? Chair Scott. Are we getting ready to vote or what? I'm Is about that, you're to. asking for comments right now before we vote? Yeah. That, okay, yeah. look forward to that. And I, I just, I can't, I, I don't think ceding the power to, of the le the entire legislature to four people or a small group of people even is is the right thing to do. I don't I don't even know if it's you know I'm not a constitutional person, but I don't know that that would be would pass constitutional muster. And I, I think the thing to do is just to delete the language on the base bill that's on 214 to 215. We can we can reconvene. They're already getting the 30 days. They'll get another 30 days if they need it. They'll get another 30 days after that. And um, now I would also I would entertain changing the the from 90 days I would entertain moving that to 45 or 60 days, but I just I think 90 days three months is a long time, and so I. Mr. Benson, why do you need 90 days? Well, what, maybe we could ask Ms. Kelly. To Ms. Kelly, why do you need 90 days? Yeah, yeah. Like a public comment. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, two things. One, I think the. Governor's statements to you were sincere that, you know, he, he wants to be sure that you all are in partnership on what you agree to do here, that these are enormous powers that you're turning over to the governor in time of emergency. But second, I think the interest on the part of the commissioner to have it be something greater than 30 days is a couple of things. That one, we, we don't see infectious outbreaks resolved quickly and, and they ebb and flow. And what we're experiencing right now with this outbreak is that the, it is changing day to day and every couple of days. And so what we think might be the best thing to do today is going to change. Right now we've had, I believe, nine cases reported. They all have been travel related. But at some point in this outbreak, we're going to see cases reported that come from community spread. What we know in other countries is that community spread can oftentimes be within a family, but we may also see it happen within a community. So as it moves from travel related to community spread within a family to community spread within the community, our mitigation strategies and what you want the governor to do to protect the health of Minnesotans may change through that period of time. And it may be that we don't have all the answers within a 30-day period of time, which is why the commissioner is advising to extend it beyond something like that. Now, if that is through current law that requires the governor to call you all back to do it in 38-day increments, you may not, as Representative Leaving said, you may not want to be called back. We may be advising that large groups of people not meet and not congregate. And I don't know how we would resolve that issue with the need to come back and extend uh, in emergency powers. 
Um, Deputy Commissioner Kelly, of the 27 states that had adopted this model language in the wake of 9-11, how many states have extended the 30 days in the model language out to 90 in what you're proposing? Or anything other than the original model language is 30 days? Um, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure how many other states have language with the public health emergency in it. Well, this was the, this, I'm just reading off of Ms. Mullen's earlier memo that she sent to me regarding the questions I had from earlier and the number of states that had it. So if you don't know, you don't know. Oh, I'm um, sorry, Mr. 38 Chair. states, not 27, it's 38 states. Uh, Chair Scott, did you have? Yeah, I, I was, yeah, I just, I wanted to make a couple more points. And um, I think what we might be confusing here is in, if, if we have to come back in 30 days, um, or if it extends beyond, well, let me back up. So if we reach that 30-day mark that's in current law, that doesn't mean that the Department of Health can't continue to operate under, you know, quarantining people and, um, you know, isolating people and continuing on with those policies. It's, this wouldn't take that away from the Department of Health. They would be able to continue on with whatever the best practices are. But this is just saying if there are decisions, this is a check and balance. If the governor, um, whoever that person may be, is making decisions that maybe the legislature doesn't agree with or the public doesn't agree with, this is an opportunity for the, the legislature to come back and say, you know, we've granted you these special powers, and so now we need to take a look at what you're doing with those special powers. So I, I, I think that um, we're fine leaving at the 30 days because the Department of Health can go ahead and continue on with whatever, whatever those policies are that they feel are best for public health. Does that make sense? Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay, um, mm -hmm. Deputy That's Commissioner right Kelly. Uh, Representative, uh, we would be able to continue on with the authority we have in Chapter 144 around isolation and quarantine. But if we found the need to call out the National Guard to help staff our nursing homes or to help transport patients from one location to another, that ability would end and we would need to reconvene the legislature to extend that ability. There are some powers that may need to be invoked Until the that the commissioner cannot do without so the authority under emergency no, powers. Uh, Mr. Chair, just okay, one final comment. Step. When we have special session, when we call a special session for other emergencies that we've had, those that can make it, make it, and those that can't, don't. And as Representative Johnson said, you know, we just need 68 people in the House and we need 34 people in the Senate. So, um, I'll, okay. I'll be quiet now. Well, I, uh, okay, last word, uh, Representative Albright. <coughs> uh, oh, sorry, I no, got the last word, Representative Albright. Yeah, um, so thank you, Representative O'Neill. She, um, I think she found the answer to our riddle. So in, in statute, Chapter 3.30, it talks about the Legislative Advisory Commission, and I will read, I'll just read it. A general contingent appropriation for each year of the biennium is authorized in the amount of the legislature deems sufficient. Additional special contingent appropriations as the legislature deems necessary are authorized. Transfers from the appropriation to the appropriation of the various departments and agencies may be made by the Commissioner of Management Budget subject to the following provisions. A. Transfers may be authorized by the Commissioner of Management and Budget not exceeding $5,000 for the same purpose for any quarterly period. B. Transfers exceeding $5,000 but not exceeding $10,000 may be authorized by the Commissioner of Man Management and Budget with the approval of the Governor. C. Transfers exceeding $10,000 may be authorized by the Governor, but no transfer exceeding $10,000 may be made until the Governor has consulted the Legislative Advisory Commission and it has made its recommendation on the transfer. Its recommendation is advisory only. Failure or refusal of the Commission to make a recommendation is a negative recommendation. I think it's already in statute in terms of what we've been when struggling with. The Legislative Advisory Commission is already going to be uh, consulted. So if they, if the whole legislature can't come here, the LAC in statute has, already has the ability or the right to be consulted by the governor for 
transfers of exceeding ten thousand dollars. Mr. Chair, uh, Deputy Commissioner Kelly, uh, Representative Albrecht, I believe that that, and I would defer to House Research and House Council. Um, I believe that that particular section of statute refers to transfers made out of the state's contingency fund, which has about half a million dollars in it. But for certain reasons, certain purposes, one use of that fund is when we have a transition from one governor to another. And uh, that, that fund is used to set up the transition office of the new governor. That's not in statute, but that's what the fund is used for. And so uh, there is a request to the LAC to transfer more than $10,000 out of that fund to pay for that transitional office. I believe that what that consultation is referring to is specifically the use of that contingent account. Representative Albright. Chair Lesh and uh, Deputy Commissioner, I I'm, I'm only citing what I see here and I don't see that it identifies an account. It just speaks to a general contingent appropriation. So if that speaks to an account that, you know, that is all that you talk about, um, I still think it has applicability for what we're talking about here. Representative Barr, last uh, comment question before we vote on this. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess more of just a comment. Uh, Representative Scott or Chair Scott pretty much said what I wanted to say as far as the, uh, you know, Kind of lost my train of thought here, thinking about something else. But the the thirty day part, anyway. Um, throughout our history as a union, there have been numerous times where legislatures have been put under amazing stress. Um, the uh, Virginia state legislature was chased out of Richmond at gunpoint less than twelve hours after the British Army took the town of Richmond, and and they all fled on horseback. The uh, the Maryland legislature in 1961 was surrounded by the Union Army when they were taking a vote. The Capitol was surrounded by the Union Army while they were taking a vote whether to secede or stay in the Union. We've had insurrections, we've had all kinds of different things, and to think that um, legislators today are any less virulent in their duty is a little bit, uh, I don't know, it kind of shocks me that we would not rise to the, 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 the duty we've been called to do or volunteered to do when we said we want to be legislators or part of this august body. And uh, I, that's, that's pretty much my reason for the uh, 30 days. We should never, ever give a single person or a council that much authority for, for even a couple of days in my mind, leave alone 30. And, and 90 is just atrocious to me. I'm sorry. but. Thank, thank you, Representative Barr. Um, just my only comments. I, I hope I'm, I'm not wrong. I am a little bit nervous about voting for 90 days, uh, Chair Lee, when I'm going to vote for it. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I could see both sides of this uh, going bad if, if we pass or if we didn't pass it. I hope I'm not proven wrong about it. But um, it is a lot of power. Uh, and we've talked before and, and also know that once you cede um, authority to the executive, you never get it back. Ever, you just don't, um, and so uh, you know. I, I hope it's for good reason, and it's and it's not going to be a mistake extended to ninety. I didn't hear really a good reason from um, Deputy Commissioner Kelly as to why they really needed ninety. I was hoping to hear something along the lines of the incubation period of a particular virus or more viruses, but I didn't. I just heard, well, we just thought it would be a better idea, and of course, the executive always thinks it's going to be a better idea to extend authority. Um, that's would be what I was saying if I was saying in that seat as well. But uh, last word before we vote, go ahead, Chair Lieberman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for the really good discussion. I think we all have the same concern, and as we're, I really appreciate this. This is moving very fast. This is much messier than we usually try to do in committee. Um, but I, as this is making me think that perhaps the way to thread the needle here is to, um, we can't do this right now. But maybe we need to have a special provision for this that doesn't open up every power in Chapter 12, but only opens up those powers that really could be reasonably related to what kind of 
things happen in a public health emergency. So I could see that being a way to thread the needle, kind of being a little more intentional about writing a separate section for this and not just saying, okay, for this thing, because the package of powers under Chapter 12 is very broad. And maybe, maybe the governor under a public health emergency really doesn't need all of that. I, I don't personally understand enough about what is, how extensive those powers really are. And, but maybe we, I could continue to work with the department about being more specific about what powers would be needed for possibly 90 days. And, you know, I certainly, you have my commitment to, if that makes sense to anybody, I don't know if it makes sense to them, but, um, you know, we could certainly take a look at that and try to um, thread that needle a little more closely so that we're not just, I mean, I am very aware that we don't want to, either with money or with authority, allow people to use emergencies to kind of bootstrap all kinds of stuff, right? We're all very wary of that, um, you know. So I'm very uh, appreciative of everybody's point of view here and we'll you know, do my best to try to work this and make it work. Thank you, I, I appreciate that, Shirley. I, I, I said to you that that was gonna be the last word, but I got a half dozen more people on the list now. <laughs> um, so raise your hand if, if you got it, be heard on this. Chair Constantine, Chair Mariani, Chair Scott, who else? Okay, uh, but Chair Mariani Real. was first. Go ahead. Oh. Mr. Chair, I'll be very brief, um, and I apologize, Representative Liebley. It's appropriate that you do have the last word here. Uh, but I am going to vote for this, and, and I, for the record, because I think the issues being raised here, these are not partisan issues. These are, I'm feeling like you are, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chair. But uh, the comfort I have is that we're talking about um, an action here that's um, limited to public health emergency, and we're defining what that is uh, quite specifically in, in the first section here. Uh, I think if we were talking about something much broader than that, I would be... Um, Super incredibly uncomfortable. So, Mr. Chair, that's it. Thank you, Chair Constantine. Uh, like you, Chair Lesh, I never did hear a specific reason why we were going to 90 days. And just very quickly looking up the Spanish flu, it was two full years. And frankly, I'm thinking I might want to come back at 30 days rather than 60 um, when things might be a lot worse. Um, I'm going to have trouble voting for that uh, because of that. And in, the, and in the midst of that, at your Constantine Spanish flu, which I think I said earlier was actually from Kansas. Yeah. But the soldiers took it to uh, Spain. Spain when they deployed for World War I, and it got reported in Spain, so they called it the Spanish flu. Uh, and then returning soldiers brought it back here, where 18,000 Minnesotans died. Uh, and the Min and Minnesota passed the Public Safety Commission, um, which I, Berman, said, uh, well, in violate, violated all of our constitutional rights. Uh, Chair Scott. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was just going to say, I know that we're going to be hearing this, I think, Monday in Ways and Means, and I hope in the meantime we can get a few more answers by the time that committee meets. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, I wanted to just go on the record and say that I won't have another chance at looking at this bill, and I support Representative Albright and Representative Scott's position. I think if we just struck after that point and left it at 30 days, that would serve the body very well, and I hope you will continue to keep that in mind. The, the nature to Representative Mariani's point is that the addition of the public health emergency, which is very broad in my reading of the definition, is exactly why we need to keep it to 30 days. Thank you. The amendment uh, to restate is on line 1.3 of the A6 amendment uh, is, well, Okay, hold on a second. Now we, I think we have to do these as two separate amendments because one is amended to the bill and the other is amended to the amendment. Uh, so it would be strike executive council on line 1.3 and insert legislative advisory commission uh, as defined by statute three Minnesota statute 3.30. Uh, and uh, the other, uh, and then and delete the new language. And the other part of the amendment is amended to the bill itself. So we're, we should do that separate. So we're going to vote on this one first. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say no. No. Motion prevails. The oral amendment to the A6 is adopted. We're now going to uh, do the A6, and then we'll do the other amendment on line 2.21.
of the bill. Um, so uh, all in favor of the A6 amendment as amended by the previous oral amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Motion passes. The next amendment is on line 2.21 of the bill after legislature and before the period insert a comma and the words except when the peacetime emergency is a public health event that has been extended by resolution of the Legislative Advisory Commission. That is the amendment to the bill. All in favor signify by saying. I, I pardon me, Mr. Chair, but I believe that the, the language was except when the emergency is a public health emergency, not public health event, was the language right. that I heard. Yeah, that's right. Except when the peacetime emergency is a public health event. Are we saying except when the peacetime emergency is a public health emergency? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, yes, that's Then that is the amendment. Event. Does everyone get uh, get it? Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Motion passes. Um, okay, so we have the bill before us as amended. Is there any other comment on the bill as amended? Seeing none. <coughs> oh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been a long week. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> so <clears throat> on page one, I'm still very concerned. Uh, line 1.12 the language at the end of the sentence when it says an outbreak of communicable or infectious disease that it's just incredibly broad and it continues to be even more broad uh, in line 1.16 it says poses a, a probability of you know and then it continues on I don't know what that means and then point 1.20 again the same question I had before poses a significant risk of harm to a large number of people this is just incredibly, incredibly broad. Um, I would like this language either stricken or narrowed before we vote on it. I would like, particularly, I would like um, uh, 1.20 strike possess, uh, poses a significant risk of harm to a large number of people. And then I think, uh, Mr. Chair, you had pointed out substantial on line 1.19, a substantial future harm is also incredibly broad. There's just the language in here is just so, so, so broad. It's well, this is um, does does this language come straight out of the the 2003 Model Act as well? Uh, that where'd you where'd you get this? So, Mr. Chair, Chair I think that this language came out of the. The, contingent, the public health contingency fund language. We talked about this earlier today, and I do agree that this needs to be tightened up because the language coming out of that, that's great language if you're spending money. It's not tight enough if you're giving emergency powers to the executive. So I, yes. I do agree that there's some concern there. And you know, were we doing this on the slower track, on the normal track, I wouldn't uh, come back to committee with this. I would have worked on it some more but you know it wasn't really an opportunity so I am very uh, sympathetic to that view and that representative O'Neill raised it before and I'm I'm just we're just kind of talking here about how to tighten that up we can and just I strike we lines 1.8 to 1.21 to 1. I don't know if they're amenable to that yeah. well uh, let's see what uh, because they still got reasonably expected to require ev evacuation of a population poses a probability of a large number of deaths, serious injuries, or long-term disabilities in the affected population, poses a prob probability, that's still pretty broad. Um, widespread exposure, I don't know if you need that. Significant risk of future harm, I don't know if you need that. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chair, I would concur with what you just said. I, I think that that narrows it, and it still maintains the essence of what we're trying to accomplish. Well, um, so Representative O'Neill moves that lines 1.18 to 1.21 be struck. I don't know if this is a good thing to do or not. If I'm the health people, I'm going to say no because they're going to want more authority to do it. I get it. Um, but I wasn't totally sure about voting yes on the other stuff, too, and I and I did, so uh, I'm inclined to, to vote in favor of 
taking this out because who knows? We're spinning the dreidel on this well, in any case. Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, Chair Liebling. So, Mr. Chair, you know, I, uh, I'm i sort of inclined to do that as well, except that Mr. Benson is, we're kind of trying to figure out here whether this language, first of all, are these, I assume they're or. So it could be any one of these clauses would be enough to invoke it. Okay. Yeah, so that's the problem. that being the case, that's the problem. then we probably should take out some of them if it was because each one of them is not limiting it further. It's opening it up further and giving another basis on which it could be invoked. So, right. So that being the case, are we comfortable with, uh, you know, I don't think and is going to work though. Well, let me let me restate the amendment as it would be as posed by Rep. Cinema O'Neill then. It would be uh, deleting lines 1.8 to 1.21 and on line 1.15 after the word services inserting the word or. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it did make it disjunctive uh, and then replacing uh, the semicolon on line 1.17 with a period. Mr. Chair, I think that's entirely reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Representative Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm worried that that doesn't go far enough, though, because if we're looking at just what we know about now with COVID-19, what's the probability of a large number of deaths? Well, this is percentage-wise larger than what we see with influenza, but maybe that's not large enough. And we don't have anything in here that I think speaks to quarantine of people. Um, so I feel like something's not quite right if we... I agree that three and four are maybe too broad, but I also feel like we're not quite capturing um, everything we need to. Can you maybe work on capturing more between here and next committee? Okay, I'm seeing a north-south, I like that. Um, okay, well that is the amendment as stated then um, with Representative Mahler's uh, cautionary statements taken into consideration. Who, who, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quickly to Representative Mueller's point about quarantine, the department already has the authority to quarantine as they see fit. They already have that authority in the statute, so that doesn't need to be addressed in this. We'll get something figured out between now and next. Okay, the amendment is um, as stated, delete lines 1.18 to 1.21 uh, after services on line 1.15, insert an or. And on line 1.17, replace a semicolon with a period. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Hopefully say no. Motion passes. Okay. okay, now I think we're pretty much good on amendments. We got the bill. Any final statements? Chair Liebling. So, Mr. Chair, I am, uh, first of all, I'm very grateful to the committee for all the time and attention that you all have. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chair, we might not be done yet. Um, there is another amendment. And this uh, is a tweak to the data classification language oh, no. that I think Ms. Crinky wanted to speak to, if that would Do be we okay. Have that? Do we, have that? we adopted that on the A4 amendment. We already adopted that. Yeah, yeah there's an A7 that Ms. Clark has just handed me that they were working on that yeah. is, uh, is this to, to replace the A4? Don't have it. Oh. No. <clears throat> so this would replace the A4, at, Mr. At Chair. Behest, at Ms. Krinke's behest. It is okay. Chair, I don't have the A7. Yeah, we know one. I, I have them right here. <laughs> Representative Lucero, the chair didn't know about it either. Uh, so, so it's up, you know, it's the Mr. Chair. How many, is this is just one other amendment we got? So yes. what does it do? It's so, data? Uh, well, Ms. Crinky will, I think, want to tell you. Yes. Why don't we get it passed out so we can feast yeah. our eyes on it? <laughs> Good idea. Thanks for the courtesy chuckle. Chair <laughs> 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 Lesh? Yeah. yeah, Chair Johnson. I'm just wondering how many years since you've had a committee that we actually had to do this on the fly. <laughs> it, it's not, this is very rare for first-termers making sausage and getting extremely dirty in the process. We don't do this that much. But it is important because, you know, we've yeah. got. 
I remember as a freshman, we used to do this a lot more. And frankly, for me, the legislature was a lot more fun, more interesting to actually work with people yeah, like and it. actually get ideas, stuff no. done yeah. in committees. I'm with Shirley Link. Yeah, true. Okay, so let's make sure everyone has a copy of the, uh, the A7 amendment. Thank you. We need to register my perennial objection to classifying uh, data as plural, but I'm not going to get into that now. Uh, okay, go ahead. Ms. Krinky, did you want to explain this? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Mary Krinky and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. And I just want to thank Representative Liebling for all the work that's gone in the last 48 hours of getting this bill in shape. And we're very appreciative of all the work. Um, the language that was regarding data classification had some terms uh, that really were of concern to the Hospital Association. Things like customer lists. We don't have customer lists. Things like income income tax statements, things like uh, data on patients, um, and including credit reports. There was a lot of terms that are not appropriate for nonprofit hospitals. Now, we understand that the Department of Health is going to want some financial information from hospitals before they give out loans and grants. And so we are very comfortable with the language that Ms. Clark just drafted that um, basically says that um, they can request financial information um, from hospitals and um, they can use that to evaluate whether or not a grant or loan will be given. They can certainly ask about uh, hospital margins, reserves, or, or what other information they need. But some of the terms that were used were just very uncomfortable to us, customer sheets, income tax returns, and other words. So I think this captures what the Department of Health wanted and makes is just sort of comfort language for us for terms that are not really hospital terms. So understood. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Krinky? Yeah. No? Okay. No, I have questions for the oh. bill or for the bill author. On this well, whatever. Any I'm questions sentence. on this? Go ahead, Trisca. Thank you, Mr. I'm Chair. Sorry. And um <laughs> Chair Liebling, in your discussions with uh, Minkoji, uh, did you have those directly um, with the drafting of the bill that we, or the amendment that we already adopted on the data provisions? Did you have personally contact with Minkoji on that, or is that somebody else in the tent well, negotiating? Chair Liebling. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Scott. So, um, uh, House Research, Mr. Johnson was uh, working on this, and it was all by email. So uh, he suggested the language that went in, and I'm, I don't have a copy of that oh, that amendment that we adopted. If anybody has one, to that they can give me. But um, oh, thank you, Senator um, So um, uh, that was how that happened. So I didn't have direct. There was a there was someone here earlier who said to me, "This is no. great." You know, they apparently uh, that gentleman Matt Elling uh, also he mm -hmm. so he approved that other language and yeah, that was what he was comfortable with and you know, kind of Mr. Johnson mediated that whole thing. So that was what that was. But um, I hadn't talked to um, Ms. Crinky here about that, and it was just some of these terms in here that were giving her a little bit of heartburn. I don't know how substantive this is really, but uh, Just got Mr. Chair, sense. thank you. And thanks for that explanation. And I just don't want to undo um, some peace in the valley that's already been accomplished on the data sections. And so, mm -hmm. and I know the hospital association didn't have their eyes on this adopted uh, amendment for very long. Uh, well, it was posted last night, I think. Right, the amendment was the the data amendment was posted last night. So, um, Minco, I, I just got a text that said Minco. What? Apparently, it's good. <laughs> the hospital well, languages. Yes. House research thinks it's good, and it comes from Minkoji. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't come from Minkoji. <laughs> Similar to the language that Minkoji suggested. 
So it's substantially similar, you're saying? Okay. All right, Mr. Chair, I just wanted a couple seconds to digest this. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, okay, any other questions Mr. for the- Mr. Chair. The Reps of Newer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, <laughs> yeah, Madam Chair, uh, for presenting this bill. I've got a question about the Second Amendment A7, because this anticipates that the only nonprofit healthcare uh, centers will be getting the uh, loan or the grants. Uh, if you use the initial uh, amendment, it, it captures the other institutions which are not considered nonprofit. If you choose the second one, that excludes anyone else other than the hospital institutions. Can that be clarified? Uh, I'm going to phone a friend on that one, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that question. Because I, I haven't been involved in the drafting of this, just to be clear, I'm trying to... This is going so quickly that people are working on it while I'm sitting here talking to the committee. So here's the news. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Neuer. Um, again, for the record, my name is Diane Rydrick from the Health Department. Um, one of the changes that was made here in the A7 was to just refer to the financial information more generally rather than calling out specific things like a credit report or a financial projection. And our thought was if you refer to it just using an umbrella reference to financial information collected as part of the application, that might cover all types of information given that right now we don't know specifically which ones we would collect. So it might allow a little more security in that way. Representative Neuer. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I think this is more broad-based um, uh, information, so I think that will be determined by the department when they request that information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for the author? Uh, then anyone else in the audience who wishes to be heard on this? We're going to proceed to a vote on House File 4327 as. What about the amendment? Oh, yeah, the amendment. <laughs> okay, all in favor of the A7 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. Motion passes. And uh, we've got the bill as exhaustively amended uh, before us, and there's no one else who here wants to talk about it. So, so Mr. Uh, Chair Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've now adopted the A7 and the A4, and they both amend the same section. So we have to determine, I think we have to reconsider the first one that we adopted. Well, I, I, think, we can have, I think we can have the clerk work that out, right? Huh? Yeah, one trumps the other, supersedes the other. So we're reconsidering the A4? Can I? I, Mr. I Chair, I was going to say the same thing. Usually the procedure is you reconsider the one that was adopted and then you do the other okay, one. Okay, which one do you want to reconsider? So we would reconsider the, I, so I would move to reconsider the A4 amendment. Okay, all in favor of reconsideration of the A4 signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. Motion passes. Uh, the A4 is before us. No, and the A7, A7 is before us now. Well, no, the A4 is reconsidered oh, yeah, before us. We so can I'm consider what we want. So I'm going to withdraw the A4 okay. and offer the A7. Okay. Thank you. So um, the A7 has been moved. Um, all in favor of the A7 signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. no. Motion passes. I hope we did that right, but we'll find out later. Uh, then we have the, the bill before us as, as amended multiple times. Any other questions? I'm not going to ask for reservations because I know there are plenty of those. But, um, the motion is, is that uh, from Chair Liebling is that House File 4327 as amended be re-referred to Health and Human Services Finance. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Motion passes and the I bill like as it. amended is re-referred to <laughs> HHS Finance. Thank you again. Members, thank Remember. you. This is not an easy thing to do and I'm sure we might have made a couple mistakes, but they'll catch them in HHS Finance. If there are additional issues, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss them here. Committee's adjourned. Oh, yeah.